the film The True Cost makes clear, people in wealthy countries consume an extraordinary amount of stuff. I mean, lots of stuff. And it's not just clothing, but all sorts of stuff. From small stuff like smartphones to big stuff like cars. Incidentally, our country, the United States, arguably leads the world when it comes to consuming stuff. Environmentally, this is a double-edged sword, harming both people and the earth. So I just want to, you know, clarify that. This is, of course, on the climate crisis, but it also involves more things than just the climate crisis environmentally. There's lots of things like point source pollution, where companies um, are individually um, releasing toxic materials into the environment, either directly, like as a byproduct of their factories by putting things into streams, or indirectly by producing things like single-use plastics that go out into the world that, that won't go away for tens of thousands of years. In addition to the environmental slash climate issues, there, is all, there are also social justice issues. And that's one of the things we're going to be focusing on today. What's the human cost involved here? And the important thing to realize about this is that it's an intersectional issue. And what I mean by that is you, you can't talk about the climate crisis without justice issues along with it. You can't talk about those justice issues in many cases without talking about the climate crisis along with it. So that's what we'll be doing today by way of this uh, documentary, our documentary for the week, The True Cost. First, here's the issue. All the stuff is made of natural resources, of course. A smartphone, for example, is made of dozens and dozens of different kinds of materials. Some of them, like the cobalt used for the batteries, cause significant social and environmental problems through their mining, which directly harms workers, including children in some mines, as well as the environment by contaminating air, land, water, etc. And by the way, they're, they're just in the batteries. There are a great many you know, minerals being used. Uh, most people think of lithium, but cobalt is also a significant issue and lots of other issues as well. So on the one hand, there's that. That's the extraction and what's extracted from the earth to, um, to make these things, the materials for them. And lots of things are extracted. Um, but then there's the flip side. The, these thing, this stuff requires an enormous amount of energy. That produces, of course, greenhouse gases. Uh, the manufacture of an automobile can release more than a dozen tons of carbon dioxide or equivalent gases into the atmosphere. Some luxury SUVs are responsible for three times as much. And, um, there was a study of Range Rovers a few years ago, and it found out they released 35 metric tons. So who's responsible for all this? Is it the consumers or is it the companies that manufacture this stuff? Um, first off, let's be clear. Thing, energy is used in, um, or greenhouse gases are emitted in a variety of ways. We might think of it principally in their use. So let's take uh, an electric car, for example. An electric car requires electricity, obviously, to run, so you have to keep recharging it. That's the equivalent of putting gas into the tank when you put electricity into the batteries of the electric car. That's one thing, and people often just look at that. And that's a problem because there's a whole another set of emissions that we generally refer to as externalities. And those would be involved, for example, in manufacturing the car itself. So in terms of an electric car, it requires a significant amount more energy to manufacture it. And of course, that involves more greenhouse gases to produce it. Now, it's saved in the electric car by way of the electricity, which if it's renewably produced, will have fewer emissions, um, take fewer emissions than putting gas in the tank. But we can't forget those externalities, um, just to clarify. But then to get to the central point of this slide, who is responsible for all this? Is it consumers, the people that drive around in the cars, use the cars, or is it the companies that manufacture all the stuff, the people that make the cars? So, a variety of corporations and their advocates have long argued that we consumers are the problem. After all, they just make what we want. If we didn't want it, they wouldn't make it, and there wouldn't be a problem. Consequently, consequently, since we are the problem, it is up to us to address the issue. If we really want to do something about it, then we should simply stop buying or at least become minimalists. 
Yeah, that's the argument that, you know, um, you could say, let's talk about this. Well, we could talk about in cars. You could say, well, we shouldn't buy cars at all. And Tesla might take that position. But as long as we want to buy cars, Tesla might say, well, we're going to sell them for you. And if Tesla goes out of business, another existing company like, you know, Ford or Audi or whatever will produce the cars. And if they don't, then a new company will pop up because the demand is coming from individuals and individuals aren't stopping buying cars. In fact, we're buying more cars than ever. Then they want to continue to make them. So it sounds simple enough as we consumers are to blame because we want these things and manufacturers are just giving us what we want. It's up to us to solve the problem that we've created. But are we? So in other words, with cars, well, if we're concerned about cars producing so many greenhouse gas emissions, first in their manufacturer and then, you know, using them um, all the time and not using them, as, as I've mentioned before in class, high. I mean, that's like 25 percent of your annual carbon footprint if you're the average American. If you want to do away with that 25 percent, then do away with cars. That's that's up to us. It's our decision. But guess what? We're not doing it. So, you know, don't blame the auto industry according to this argument, blame us. But are we actually to blame here? Um, so think about this idea that corporations have long been in the business of making consumers out of ordinary people, ideally insatiable rampant consumers. It sounds a little like the matrix, but corporations are in the business of making us into beings that serve them best, consumers. Unfortunately, neither we nor the earth are, are much served by this enterprise. To the contrary, it can be incredibly detrimental to our species and our planet as we are, as all other species on the planet that we, uh, we share it with. This is an odd thought in a way. You may not think that corporations are in this business of making us into consumers, but they are. And just as a first pass at this, and we're going to explore it throughout this lecture, you know, just think about what what companies do. They just don't manufacture products. They 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 market them. Marketing is a big part of it. They create brands and those brands are central to the companies. And we are, you know, um, responding to those. But this idea that, you know, um, we're actually made into consumers. Well, let me let me jump to the next slide and I'll explain it in detail. Um, and I'm going to repeat a story that I included in a couple books ago uh, on writing a new environmental era and moving forward to nature. So here's the little story. Quite a few years ago, I was visiting friends and I noticed that their young daughter, who was six or seven at the time, was watching TV. So well, every now and again, I'd glance over to see what sort of thing she was watching. I was just curious. I didn't have a child at the time. And it was clear that they were, again, they were um, vectored toward children, and particularly children like this child who happened to be female-identified. Um, and what caught my attention wasn't really the shows, but the ads. And there were things that you would have expected, like, you know, toys, sugared breakfast cereals, a local theme park. However, there's one ad that was just another beast altogether, and it was for a major cosmetics corporation. I won't mention the brand, but uh, the, whole, uh, the whole commercial was showing models having fun on a Caribbean beach. It repeatedly cut to scenes to them applying makeup up, which they were having seemingly a frolicsomely good time doing, and realizing that this ad was showing on a, on a TV show that was pitched at young girls, I, I wanted to see how it would end. I mean, would they really be trying to sell lipstick to six-year-olds? As it turns out, they weren't. The ad was not designed to sell any particular product at all, but rather to sell a brand that makes a broad range of cosmetic projects. It was really just 60 seconds of young women made happy by cosmetics. Uh, well, made happy by a particular brand of cosmetics. So they weren't trying to get six-year-olds to switch to their brand of eyeliner, were they? I mean, if they really were trying to sell cosmetics to young girls, you'd expect that at least some of the models would have been children. 
but why were there instead just young women on the screen? After thinking about it a while, the frightening answer hit me like a ton of bricks. The cosmetic company here decided that they needed to make more than cosmetics. Astonishingly, they had taken up the business of making consumers. First, they present young girls with happy and appealing young um, images of happy and appealing young women. Next, they cut to the source of the happiness, applying and wearing makeup. There is no suggestion that the young girls themselves should be wearing the makeup. Instead, it is held up as an essential part of what it is to be a woman. It may take a decade or more, but by repeatedly and subtly suggesting to girls that the road to womanhood is paved with cosmetics, a generation of consumers is created whose very sense of self, in this case, a gendered sense of self, depends on the product on offer. With so much at stake, indeed the fragile, emerging self-identity of a human being, the desire to have and the fear of being without the product becomes extraordinarily important as it is presented as an essential part of a happy and successful adulthood. Although we may think that the industry like this, you know, exists to serve us by providing all sorts of consumer goods like cosmetics, it's arguably the other way around. Human beings exist to serve these industries. Human consumption is what empowers them. An enormous amount of care and attention is thus given to fashioning human beings willing to work long hours to make disposable income and then willing to sacrifice, you know, make sacrifices in the bargain working those long hours, such as by not having time for friends and family, so that these industries can survive. It really does sound a little bit like the Matrix, doesn't it? And the idea here is, is a, this was an extraordinary example for me, that these industries are in the business, not just of making cosmetics or whatever it is they're selling, but making consumers to consume what it is they sell. So as I noted back in our discussion of Henry David Thoreau's Walden, the project has been profoundly ramped up today as young people are themselves recruited to help create a new generation of consumers. They do so by first creating a following on social media. Once a trend-setting person has a sufficient number of viewers on YouTube, they can monetize this achievement by, for example, selling cosmetics on their channel. In this sense, the project comes full circle as the trendsetter was arguably fashioned by the cosmetic industry for this role. Ironically, this trendsetter may view having been conscripted by the cosmetic industry as a great personal achievement. And maybe it was, as young people are certainly encouraged to look up to individuals of this sort. So yeah, as Thoreau realized 170 years ago, corporations are in this business. Um, the example I gave, which dates back to the era of broadcasting, when you know shows were broadcasted to thousands of people at the same time, that was it ramped up. But now it is so ramped up that it's just astonishing because the corporations, you know, are, are actually taking people that they fashioned to consume their products and then offering them up as this sort of perfect model of consumer, which then is used to get more people to buy. And, and it may actually create more consumers too, right? So imagine this uh, example, um, this 21st century example of a trendsetter having a YouTube channel where they're, you know, showing how to apply makeup and everything. Well, you know, who's watching that? Is it really their contemporaries? So say this person is in, I don't know, their teens. Uh, uh, is it people in their teens? Probably. Is it people older? Eh, maybe. But is it younger people too? Is it, you know, um, younger children who look up to these trendsetters and do exactly what that ad did before that I mentioned on TV, which is to set a model for what successful, um, you know, vibrant, um, attractive adulthood is like. And 
Yeah, it's everywhere now. And I think if you think about it, you can think of all sorts of examples where this is happening, where corporations are constructing consumers. Um, and all sorts of industries are in this business, and it certainly just involves young girls or uh, girls or young women or female identified people. I don't, I don't mean to suggest that. That was the example I gave, and it was a true example because it came from real life um, of something I saw. But it happens with boys and young men as well, obviously, with different products, also in a very gendered way. For example, certain cars are marketed um, specifically to men with great success. More than four out of five people who purchase a Chevrolet Corvette, Corvette for example, are apparently men. In both cases, marketers hope that they can exploit our insecurities, so they provide a way for us to believe that we can become more attractive, whether it's being via cosmetics or more powerful by purchasing a so-called muscle car or any of these things. And of course, um, there are plenty of products that are not gendered, although, although it does happen here. And I just wanted to, to clarify that since it was a gendered example, but it, it, it's all over the place. And it doesn't, you know, so don't worry if you if you don't identify with the gender, if you're non-binary, there are plenty of people interested, plenty of corporations interested in fashioning you into a consumer one way or another. So yeah, what a, what a mess this is. So the film, The True Cost, shows us the ugly side of this consumption machine, which is a disaster for both us and the planet, as well as for the people making our clothes. In terms of clothing, the average American purchases over 60 new items of clothing every year, not including incidentals like socks and underwear. Thus, although we consumers are seemingly the ones that benefit by all this, it is the corporation selling us all this stuff that really profit. And our job is to buy briefly wear the article of clothing and then dispose of it and repeat and repeat this. So while the true cost focuses on the fashion industry, this ramped up consumerism impacts all sorts of products and industries. Yeah, and it's interesting because the fashion industry, the clothing industry, you know, is really the one that first comes up with this term or it's applied to. And this has been going on for quite a long time, hundreds of years. And that's fashion. And we actually call it fashion. You say, Roy, I'm, you know, I like fashion. I'm into fashion. But what we're really talking about is this notion that the item on offer is fashionable for a time and then goes out of fashion. And originally, or one of the original senses of this was clothing. So in the original model uh, from Thoreau's time, anyhow, it happened once a year. Things became fashionable for a year. The season was over and there might be a second season and it goes out of fashion. But now with the clothing industry, as we'll see, there, there are many, many fashion cycles throughout the year. And now all sorts of things become fashionable as the industry realized this. So um, famously, Henry Ford said with the Model T that it was available in one car and the car was said not to have changed for, for well over a decade. It's not exactly true, but the idea there is basically stands in that there wasn't any change to it. Um, hence, unless your car actually broke or became old or something, you wouldn't need to buy a new car. Um, one of Ford's competitors quickly realized, or a number of them quickly realized that, you know, if you made cars go in and out of fashion, you'd sell a lot more cars. And the Ford you know, company ultimately got on board for this bandwagon and began doing the same. So now, you know, car, um, the fashionable cycle for a car is just two or three years. New models or new variations on models come out, new cars and all, so that your car is no longer in fashion. And if you see someone driving a car that's like 10 years old, is clearly, you know, two body styles behind, doesn't seem fashionable. And even if you're happy with that car, you know, the market pressures are being exerted on you to, to get a fashionable car. So, um, 150 years ago, Thoreau, you know, desperately tried to convince us the truth of all this when he argued that the goal of the clothing industry was, and I'm quoting Thoreau, not that mankind be well and honestly clad, but unquestionably that corporations be enriched. So what's the, the project here is that it, you know, you have good, sturdy clothing that keeps you warm and, and protects you. Um, now, Thoreau realized that that was once the reason the clothing 
clothes were made, the original reason, but something had happened that now that the Industrial Revolution was ramping up, produce so many, producing so many textiles, they had to sell you more than you ever needed. And this is why they were in this business of creating these fashionable cycles. And, you know, is it because to make sure that, you know, you have good clothing? No. It's so that they could be enriched. By the way, that statement seems like it could have been written today, right? That's it's an indication of how close the row to, is to us 170 years ago. The, the concerns of modernity were already there for him. And yeah, he saw that it was all about the corporations and them becoming wealthy. So at the risk of repeating myself, my earlier question, just who is responsible for this? Is it us, the consumers, or the companies that manufacture all this stuff? Thoreau certainly thought that industry was principally to blame. Yeah, and I've argued this before in previous lectures, but let me repeat myself again. Look at the tobacco industry. Who's the tobacco industry? Who is the tobacco industry doing all this for? Um, was it for themselves or consumers? Now, they argued for decades that the consumers were the problem, that that argument I rolled out a few minutes ago, that they just made what consumers wanted. Consumers wanted cigarettes, so they made them and sold them to them. But it was very clear that the tobacco industry spent a fortune constructing, you know, making consumers, people that would buy their product, and they had something good going for them insofar as it made them profits. I mean, it was, it was horrible, but it was good for their profits. And that is that it was addictive. And, you know, once they got someone, you know, using the product, they would continue using the product again and again and again. So this is the, the sort of the paradigm in a way or a root example of how the system works. It's designed to get you using the product so that you really can't stop using the product, then blame you using the product if you're unhappy about, you know, what it's doing to your health or why it's costing you all this money and all. Um, and they would shift blame the tobacco industry again and again, saying it was, it was the fault of people who were using it, not the industry. But it was very clear the industry spent a lot of time constructing consumers and, you know, um, selling them an addictive poison. So I'm curious to, to uh, what you all make of this. Do you agree with Thoreau? Having been given a glimpse inside the fashion industry with the true cost, what's your response? While this film is about the fashion industry, other industries um, or other industries now following suit. I argued that they were. In other words, in addition to fast fashion, do we now have all sorts of things like fast consumer electronics? Well, that's the thing. So uh, the true cost is about the fashion industry, textile, clothing industry. But you, if you think about it, are there other fast things too? I mean, the original fast product we you know, talked about was, people started talking about was fast food a few decades ago. But um, there are lots of things. And consumer electronics is a good example. You know, the phone that you have um, comes out every year, just like the fashion industry used to be. Um, you know, Apple comes out with a new smartphone and it has all sorts of new appealing features and it's made to think that you're made you're made to wish for that, hope for that, just as you would have hoped for that new garment, uh, because the one that you had from last year is, is now outdated. So fashion broadly speaking, involves just not individual um, clothing, but all sorts of things now. Um, so another, the alternate film this week was Patriot Act. And uh, this is a, was a Netflix series that now I think is entirely available on um, YouTube. And this particular episode was called The Ugly Truth of Fast Fashion. And I think it provides a really interesting, useful supplement to the true cost. Um, that episode, um, um, focused on a number of um, amusing anecdotes, and that's something we'll talk about in a minute, the fact that the episode was an anecdote. Uh, amusing. And perhaps the most amusing part of a generally funny documentary is when we discovered that a garment that has a tag suggesting that it is 100% recycled refers not to the garment itself, but rather just the paper tag. So if you didn't see it, you know, you go into a store, you see a garment, someone looks at it and says 100% recycled, you think the garment's entirely recycled, 100%, and then you realize that the, that 
big, you know, um, advertisement that it's 100% recycled referred just to the paper tag. And this is something that we'll talk about throughout the course called greenwashing, where they're giving you the, the corporations are giving you the impression in lots of different ways that their product is pretty renewable and, and green. Um, the fact is it um, may not be at all so. So um, let's jump to the next line. Um, the Patriot Act episode doesn't take us inside the fashion industry, and the true cost certainly did that with things like scenes from the Rana Plaza disaster. Um, it nonetheless makes clear um, to me that it's an effective critique of the fashion industry. However, what I find particularly interesting is the format. It's, so it's like one third the length of the true cost. Um, quite a bit has been crammed into that episode, but it, but it doesn't seem rushed to me. And of course, it manages to make us laugh out loud in spite of the horrific subject matter. So if you haven't watched it, well, even just the last example, where you see um, the very funny um, uh, host, who is a comedian, um, draw attention to the fact that that tag is the only thing recycled, that's pretty funny when you first read it. and. Uh, I hear it. But when you think about it, it's it's horrific. And and the fact that, you know, these companies are duping individuals to think that they're making, you know, environmentally sound choices. Um, to me, this episode of Patriot Act, you know, raises an important question that we're going to address a little later in the course and really throughout the course. You know, how do you go about informing the public issue of issues like this? So a full-length documentary like The True Cost is a traditional, and I would argue, nonetheless, great approach. And I do because, you know, I use full-length documentaries throughout the, um, the lecture series. But it's not without its shortcomings, as it may not attract a huge audience. So you may not have seen any of these documentaries in the course before. Not because they're not generally available. Many of them are. But because, yeah, who wants to put an hour when you sit down in front of, you know, your your TV or computer, who wants to spend, you know, an hour and a half watching something horrifically depressing, and I think it is, like the true cost, given that you have a lot of other options. So the question is, if documentaries really aren't reaching a large audience, and I don't think they are, um, should we be experimenting with other ways of getting the message out? And, and one would be the sort of the biting comedy of the Patriot Act. Um, and I throw it out there, just a general question, if you have other um, ideas on how we could get the message out. I think comedy is a good one. I think there are others as well, but it's it's something to think about and intriguing in the era of um, where we are, which is the era of um, multimedia and new media of all sorts. So here's the class discussion with the normal disclaimers. Here's the first um, comment. Every single employee deserves a living wage, trade unions, pension, safe working conditions, and health care. However, the numerous disasters, including the collapse of Rana Plaza and factory fires, show how little greedy companies care. The less money these corporations spend on infrastructure and employee benefits, the more profit is made for a small group of individuals at the top. That's that 1% that we started the course talking about. The person goes on, My mother, who immigrated to the U.S. decades ago, has experienced working conditions in garment factories in both China and San Diego. She talked about the poor living conditions, not making enough to eat, the long hours, and the strict management. So let me continue with this slide. The treatment of garment workers makes me awfully angry, this person continues. The poorest people in the world who face innumerable struggles and can't afford the necessities in life, like shelter, food, childcare, healthcare, etc., support the selfish lifestyles for the rest of the world. And what makes it even worse is that most people don't know where their clothes come from. The problem with American culture is that people have insatiable desires for more and the need to meet unrealistically high standards. Instead of buying quality fair trade clothing for a higher cost than that will last longer, Americans go towards purchasing cheap clothing that is made to be worn for a few times and disposed of. The cheap clothes come from mothers, come from mothers who can't afford to care for their children and cotton farmers who face the health consequences from pesticides. 
wow, what an incredibly powerful statement. And hey, it's all true, squarely on the mark. And let me quote this person again. Every single employee on the planet deserves a livable wage, trade union rights, pension, safe working conditions, and health care. Yeah. So the International Trade Coalition, it's the ITUC, ranks 139 countries against 97 internationally recognized indicators to assess where workers' rights are protected in law and practice. Basically, the ITUC has created five tiers in order to clarify where workers are most protected. So I mention this because let's look at where workers are most protected and have it best. Scoring the number one at the very top are countries like Norway and Denmark, where right violations are not a regular occurrence. And I would note that those are the countries, those countries are, um, those two cases anyhow, democratic socialist countries. Uh, they're democracies, strong, powerful democracies, but like the United States under the New Deal that, um, you know, Roosevelt initiated in the 1930s, workers' rights are really protected. This is, those are companies that are basically, you know, run by the people for the people where corporations are not in control. So next down are countries like Japan and Switzerland. They're number two on the scale, where repeated violations of rights do occur, and it happens. Going down, remember we're talking on a scale of one to five, so we just went one and then two was Japan and Switzerland. The number three tier would be countries like China and Ghana, where irregular, where regular violations of rights, um, you know, happen. Um, in, at the very bottom of the scale in the fifth tier are countries like Bangladesh and Nigeria, where there is no guarantee of rights. And Bangladesh, of course, is what where like the Rana Plaza disaster happened that was documented in the true cause. So you may have noticed that I skipped a layer there. I went from China and Ghana, number three, down to number five, Bangladesh and Nigeria. Um, so you may wonder what's in that fourth tier right above you know bangladesh and nigeria and in these countries there are systematic violations of rights not there are no rights as there are like in bangladesh and nigeria but systematic broad problems with it um there are tier four countries include places maybe you wouldn't be surprised like kenya but you might be surprised in tier four second to the bottom for workers rights is the United States. Um, so to go back to this person's comment where they talked about their mother working in garment factories in both China and the United States, maybe here, you know, feeling nationalistic pride in the U.S., you may have felt that when this person's mother, as they noted, came from China to the United States, working in the garment factories in one country and the other, that it would have been a big improvement coming to the United States. But according to this ranking, it's not. The United States would have been worse. Um, the, this person's you know, mom, if they have, had gone to a place like Paraguay or Ghana, Namibia, um, any number of countries, they would have had better working conditions than the United States. Um, and, you know, if it were just in terms of human right violations, this person's mom would have been better to stay in China rather than to come to San Diego. And of course, San Diego is just, you know, I don't know, a few hours south of us if you drove there. So it's an interesting comment, because interesting um, observation here regarding the uh, bad conditions in the U.S. as well, because sometimes you might think if you go buy a garment that has a label made in the USA, that ensures that the workers were protected and did not have their rights violated. But it's not. It is not a guarantee. And of course, you know, what we're particularly talking about, what we're, we're often talking about here in this industry are undocumented Americans. And in that case, it's the conditions can be very, very bad in garment factories and in the garment industry. Um, and we might think that these rights violations happen far from home. And when you're watching the true cost, uh, maybe, I don't know, you think, well, gee, it's horrible what's happening in Bangladesh, but oh boy, I'm glad I live, you know, happy I'm living in the United States. Um, but there are widespread violations in the U.S. as well. Um, you could imagine a story, um, a documentary, a sequel to the true cost be, being made, the true cost 
the US, the U.S. story, uh, which would take us uh, inside of garment factories in the United States, which in many ways would be, I think, as poignant as the original film in, in many ways. So, yeah, what a great comment that was. Next comment. While watching The True Cost, it made me more suddenly wary of the impact just one person can really have on climate. I think that... Um, uh, we think that just one. We think that because we're just one person, we can't be contributing uh, much to this widespread issue. The the reality is that we are individually damaging the climate. Watching this film, I knew about the impact I made on the environment with the everyday choices I make, but seeing it was a whole different story. My family is from India, and I have visited there so often, and I have seen these horrific labor circumstances firsthand, making them far more impactful for me. India. Has has a large population of overexerted laborers, um, though most of what they make is for export purposes. Yeah, so a number of great intersected points here. Um, first, just to clarify in terms of that ranking, India is at the very bottom with ba Bangladesh in the fifth tier, where there is, according to the ranking, quote, no guarantee of rights. Um, and as this person aptly notes, most of what they make for export purp is for export purposes. And that's the same in Bangladesh or China or two previous, uh, we were just talking about them. Um, so we might, you know, think that this is an issue contained within, in this case, India. You know, it's all about India, but it's not because India and China and Bangladesh are making these things in part for the people there, but overwhelmingly for export in most cases. Um, you know, so even though it might seem that the true cost is about horrible working conditions in places like Bangladesh and Cambodia, it's in part really about the U.S. and our insatiable consumerism. Indeed, there, um, for, you know, there could be an illuminating supplement to the film's title. It could well have been called The True Cost of Our Insatiable Consumerism on the Rest of the World. I, th I think that would have been a, a good title. So, again, you think it's about the U.S., but really... It's it's about someplace else. I mean, you think about someplace else, but really, it's about the U.S. too and what we're doing here. In a sense, that the film holds a mirror up to this. While we can and and absolutely should be outraged at the corporations that directly exploit people in Bangladesh, Cambodia, and all across the planet, some of that anger should be turned in on ourselves as these companies are doing it for us. Of course. None of us are authorizing these corporations to violate the rights of people across the planet. However, when we buy things like shirts that cost, you know, five or ten dollars, yet are sewn by hand, um, we need to realize that we are enabling a system that does just that to people across the planet. To again repeat the previous comment, every single employee deserves a living wage, trade union rights, pension, safe working conditions, and health care. There's simply no way that you can achieve that even in a place as poor as Bangladesh, well, you know, you can't achieve that and produce a garment that can be sold for $5. However, this comment raises the question, which we've been addressing again and again in this course, the question is the impact that just one person can really have. We're sometimes told that an individual action does little as it's just a drop in the bucket. For example, why shouldn't we get on that airplane as it will take off regardless of whether, you know, that one seat is empty or not. However, if two people do this, it will mean that one less flight will happen. Individual action is part of the equation, but as I never tire of saying, it has to be coupled with activism and political action. In this case, laws need to be enacted across the planet to protect the rights of work workers as well as to protect the planet itself. Although we might think that this only applies to places like Bangladesh and Cambodia, as I noted, you know, we need major reform in the U.S. as well. And it, incidentally, paying a lot for a product doesn't necessarily ensure that money goes to people who actually make it. Um, iPhones are an interesting example, and I, I looked this up on them a few years ago. Um, let's assume an iPhone costs around $1,000, which they can today. Um, and that's actually a little less than the base cost of Apple's current top-of-the-line model right now. So what percentage of that $1,000 do you think goes to the people who actually make it? 10%, 20%, 30%? 
In fact, just 2% of an iPhone's cost goes to the workers who make it. Just 20 bucks. $20 of a thousand. It might seem that because this is such a high-tech device, most of the thousand dollars would go to the components. However, the majority of the cost, 51%, in other words, $510 of that thousand go to profits for Apple. Hence, since Apple is already a wildly profitable country company, if they reduce the amount of the purchase price that goes to profits uh, by just 2%, they could double the amount that goes to workers. So in other words, if they didn't make $510 in profits, they made $490 in profits, which seems like an incredible amount of profit from $1,000. Um, they could double the, the amount that they paid employees, but they don't. Think about that for a moment. Apple could double the amount that is going to workers with an almost negligible impact on their profit, but they don't. So, you know, just how bad are the working conditions in the factories that make iPhones, you might ask? Well, starting around 2010, the number of deaths by suicide in the Foxconn plant that produces iPhones became so great that they had to install large nets outside the buildings to catch the falling bodies. So the conditions are so bad that people were going over to the windows and throwing themselves out to their death. And instead of addressing the underlying problems there, Foxconn came up with a quick, easy, and I would imagine relatively inexpensive solution. They just put nets all around the building so that if someone fell out, they'd fall into the net and not, um, and not die. Um, it seems like to me they should have addressed the underlying problems, but I guess I don't think um, in terms of profit the way, every, the way corporations sometimes do. So the next comment, I learned about the horrific factory workers' conditions in my world um, history class as well. There was an incident that the professor mentioned that was similar to the Rana Plaza collapse that happened during the Industrial Revolution. In the spring of 1911, a fire broke out in the Triangle Shirtways Company. It's a very famous example, by the way. The company was one of the largest garment factories in the east side of Manhattan. There were 146 Jewish and Italian young women working at the time that were trapped inside of the ninth floor the building. All 146 of those women burned to death, asphyxiated, or jumped to their death. It's the sad truth is that the fashion industry hasn't really changed since the Industrial Revolution. There have been so many deaths that have occurred inside of these factories and nothing happened to correct them. The fast fashion industry still exists and people are still dying because of the exploitation of this industry. It's inhumane, unjust, and destroys the planet. Well, yeah, another incredibly powerful um, comment. And it's an important point. Um, although the fashion industry is relatively new, the problem of work, workers' rights goes back very far. And in fact, the same year that Thoreau published Walden, 1854, there was a novel that dramatized that called Mary Barton, published by Elizabeth Gaskell. And it was about the um, textile factories in England. So it goes back very far. It goes back further than that. But I mean, the public has been aware of it and made aware of it. But to this example, during the 1911 fire at the Triangle Waitress Company, this person references 146 people um, were, as this person, trapped inside the uh, ninth floor of the factory. And they were locked in to the, the, uh, the work area there. And the doors to the stairwells and exits were also locked. So they were locked in, imprisoned in the area they were working. And why were they? Well, this was a common practice at the time to prevent workers from taking unauthorized breaks or to reduce theft. So this person couldn't go walk out and, you know, take a break for five minutes or walk out and steal an item of clothing, according to this. So they locked the doors. I mean, could they position some of the doors so that they, you know, could... Um, see if someone were walking out with a garment, I guess, but the idea was just to lock them in, um, which, you know, if it sounds scary, like, you know, a prison tactic, it is, but then what happened here was that people rushed to the doors to get out, and all the doors were locked, and they had no escape from the fire. 
Incidentally, the Triangle Shirtwaist Company fire in 1911 proved to be something of a watershed event in workers' rights as public outcry inspired uh, workplace safety laws that revolutionized industrial work nationwide in the United States. And in fact, one of the people who actually witnessed that fire was Francis Perkins. You may not know Francis Perkins, but Francis Perkins helped um, organize and implement in, in industrial reforms and later became FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's labor secretary and the first female cabinet member in the United States. Perkins later said that the Triangle Work um, Shirtwaist Company fire was the day that the New Deal was born. So uh, in response to this, people became, this fire, people had been increasingly angry at large corporations exploiting laborers and in the labor and in the United States that anger grew and grew to the time of the Great Depression when people were outraged at the way companies were exploiting individuals and that created a whole new range of laws the New Deal which was put forth by FDR. But it's important to remember that there are tons of people like Francis Perkins, Perkins working in that administration to implement, it, the, implement these laws that protected workers' rights. And they continued and continued to be strengthened those laws. Well, into the 1960s and, and by the 70s, though, they began to be eroded. And certainly by the time Ronald Reagan comes in to office, they became eroded very quickly. And we now have a situation where corporations are, you know, in control of the government in many respects. And these laws have been sort of pushed by the wayside. You don't hear a lot about, you know, um, um, unions nowadays. I mean, we do. We just did at UCSB because we had this union contract that was renegotiated with our graduate students. But not so much. And um, that's one of the reasons I would argue that when you rank workers' rights on a scale of one to five, the United States is, is down there um, pretty low, actually, at number four. Next comment. The true cost really made me rethink the harms of the fashion industry. Living in South Korea, fashion is a great influence among all people, determining a critical view of wealth, appearance, and general well-being. People in Korea take fashion seriously and regularly change their clothes according to trends, accurately portraying fast fashion. I believe that this documentary holds an important message the Koreans must understand before taking too much value in clothing. So this is another great point. Although we may think of fast fashion as a U.S. phenomenon, something that is, you know, part and parcel of what we've been talking about, this idea of the American dream, um, that dream has now spread around the world. As this comment aptly notes, fashion has taken on a symbolic meaning as a critical indicator of wealth, appearance, and general well-being. So people in Korea, as well as across the planet, uh, still quoting this person, take fashion seriously and regularly change their clothes according to trend. Although in some sense it's taken centuries, the fact that the fashion industry has yoked our very sense of self with the clothes that we wear is an astonishing achievement, especially as it's now a worldwide phenomenon. And of course, clothing, um, clothes have always taken on a symbolic role, but it was globally never mass marketed to everyone to such an extent and arguably was never so successful as it is now. Instead of looking and listening carefully for signs of inner general well-being, to quote this person, we've been trained by the fashion and other industries to see clothing as an indicator of health and happiness as well as prosperity, as this person noted. Of course, even um, if you think about it just a little, it's obviously not the clay case in any way an indicator, not an indicator of someone's well-being and health, how well they're dressed. Um, I mean, clearly if someone, you know, is, is impoverished and doesn't have clothing, if you see someone who's, you know, um, unhoused uh, walking down the street of Santa Barbara, and unfortunately we have a large unhoused population here, which, you know, shows the systemic breakdown that has occurred in this U.S., in the U.S. in the last few decades. Um, that may be something of an indicator, but for most of us, it's not an indicator. If you're wearing the most fashionable thing, it doesn't suggest well-being. Um, and especially since now that the, um, you know, fast fashion industry and phenomenon has driven down the cost of clothing, it no longer functions as a, an accurate indicator of wealth. When things are so inexpensive that you can buy them from a fast fashion outlet, 
anyone can be wearing new clothes. Or not anyone, but many, many people, especially in a wealthy country like the U.S. Although, they're very clear, it's not, you know, an entirely wealthy country. There are many people um, who, who aren't wealthy. And I, I mentioned the unhoused, but, you know, plenty of people would be in that category. But for the most part, um, many people in the U.S. can buy new clothing because of fast, fast fashion and the new, you know, calculus that is created in that industry. But it continues, clothing, to have a symbolic um, importance, which marketers are happy to continue and promote. So the next statement. This week, watching the 30-minute um, episode of The Ugly Truth of Fast Fashion was very interesting. Its humorous approach delivered important information in a friendly format that was easy to receive. And yet all the information was a giant slap in the face of just how horrible the fast fashion industry is. Even though Hassan, and that's the host, um, would joke about the actual ridiculousness of a society that has 52 fashion um, seasons per year, he didn't take any of the seriousness away from that particular issue. In fact, just when viewers started to think that maybe the problem weren't as bad as they seemed, he brought down some very undeniable statistics that really made the audience think. As a person who has trouble getting people to care about some of the things that I think are most important, it was almost revolutionary for me to, uh, for me watching this comedian um, get just about everyone to stop and pay attention to such an important issue like fast fashion. And it, this is a great, great comment. And it does raise this question. How indeed do you get people caring about issues that are important, such as the climate crisis, to, to care? You know, uh, how do you, you know, to get people to care about these? One option, the option here in this um, Patriot Act episode is to entertain while explaining the issue. Perhaps surprisingly, entertainment um, um, can be surprisingly effective. Um, but just to be clear, it's it's a dicey business because you don't want to take something serious and make it into a laughing matter. And I, and I would argue that you know, one of the reasons that the true cost deals with the Rana Plaza disaster where a thousand people died, and one of the reasons that it was dealt with there, but not in the episode of the Patriot Act, was because you, know, you just don't want to laugh about that. I mean, no matter how how much you want to keep it lighthearted, there's no way to do that in a documentary would be appropriate. Um, and you don't want the, something like the climate crisis to be a laughing matter. Um, you know, on the other hand, if you, if you bait people with the idea that this is going to be just entertainment, and then you hit them with some really disturbing, horrible information, well, they may shut the show off right mid-episode, and they may never return to the series. So there are shows. Um, Patriot Act is one. Last night with, uh, I'm sorry, last week with John uh, Oliver, The Daily Show. They've all worked at perfecting this satirical approach to important issues with short comedic interludes that really seems to work. I mean, not all the time, but it, but it surpri works surprisingly well. Consequently, the host of Patriot Act was able to, as this comment rightly notes, joke about the actual ridiculousness of a society that has 52 fashion cycles per year. But he didn't take away any of the seriousness of that issue in the process. Regarding the notion that there are now 52 fashion seasons per year instead of the original, you know, fall and spring fashion shows from a generation or two ago, it may seem ludicrous that stores would need to replenish their stock on a weekly basis. But um, as the following comment notes, there may indeed be more than one shipment a week. So I want to get to that comment, but I do want to note here that um, another great example, aside from the shows like the John Oliver Show, Daily Show and all that, um, a great example would be the follow-up thing that um, Leonardo DiCaprio did to um, talk about the climate crisis. So we saw him doing, uh, you know, the tr um, before the flood, 
but he later produced, um, he actually did produce, but was in the film along with Jennifer Lawrence, the film Don't Look Up, which was very funny. And I think it's still available on Netflix if you have to happen to get that. Um, and it's a great entertaining to show, you know, the worry about it, you know, um, being horrible entirely, but it's about how the earth is destroyed by a great catastrophe because people aren't concerned about it. And it's meant to be, you know, this obviously allegory for the climate crisis. And I think it's, you know, our friend Leonardo DiCaprio trying to find another way of, of addressing the issue. He's done it seriously in more than one documentary and supporting other documentaries like the um, of Cowspiracy, which we'll see. But also he, he tries the comic approach. And I would argue that it's, that it's a pretty great film. So the next comment. I worked in clothing retail at a mid-range department store, Macy's, if you care to know. When Hassan says drowning in clothing as the model for fast fashion uh, production, I had vivid flashbacks to spending hours upon hours in the docks, unpacking boxes, stripping off plastic bags, and hanging, folding, and adding sensors to garments. We received two shipments of clothing per week, plus whatever trucks came in randomly. I couldn't imagine everything selling at that rate uh, to warrant that many articles of clothing put on the floor, but people bought it. Everyone is ravenous for cheap fashion. Everyone believes in the fundamental rights to express themselves through their fashion choices. It's unbelievable. It's interesting to think about there being a fundamental right to express yourself through fashion. I don't recall that being in the U.S. Constitution. Yet, as this person rightly notes, many people seem to believe that this is one of their rights. This must be enormously rewarding for marketers, as people have been turned to consumers who believe that they have the right to buy as much as they want in order to express themselves. As I noted earlier, our very sense of self has been interwoven into what we wear. What is surprising is that the fast, uh, fast fashion has sold us on the idea of quantity rather than quality. In fact, marketers have convinced us to wear poor quality clothing so that we can have more of it. Traditionally, and by this I mean up until roughly the middle of the 20th century, well-off um, people in wealthy countries had just five or six dresses, in the case of female-identified folks, and male-identified five or six suits. In order to add variety to the look, people wore interesting scarves and neckties. Although people didn't throw, uh, didn't own many items of clothing, um, these were generally of relatively high quality and carefully tailored to the individual. In the U.S., most people wore clothes made in the U.S. Exploiting the fact that garments could be made less expensively in other countries, the American clothing industry entered a period of swift decline starting about 50 years ago. Although unfortunate for the U.S. clothing industry, this meant that more and more people in the U.S. could have more and more clothing. In other words, you didn't have to be wealthy to have more than five or six outfits. Soon, nearly everyone, which could mean, uh, which meant that marketers suddenly had a much larger market than just relatively well-off individuals. So you can see the the goal here with fast fashion is that it's not just for a few wealthy people. You know, the way you could sell clothes to before, like when you were making couture outfits and all, very few people could afford it. But the idea idea here is to be able to sell it to everyone on the planet. And as they have been able to continue to drive costs down in the past few decades, this has meant that more and more people have been, you know, subjected to this fast fashion. I think I want to end, on, end there because it's, um, it's just important to understand what fast fashion has been trying to do, which is to not just make consumers out of, of wealthy individuals, which is what fashion originally was taking up, but to make consumers out of people who um, aren't wealthy, everyone. And that's why it's in, intended to go that way. So, yeah, that's the unfortunate um, truth about fast fashion. And I think we'll end on that. So take care.